Hello. Okay. So this particular conversation is a little different than what we did last time. Last time it was more of a general set of questions we were asking. Um, it was more uh, structured. Uh, this time around is a little less structured, but it kind of needs to be that way uh, because its purpose is for me to kind of convey to you some of my own past, my own dilemmas growing up, uh, some of my memories pertaining to my childhood, uh, what I went through. But basically, I'm going to be speaking on some pretty personal stuff, um, which is generally not a normal thing for Zoid to be doing, especially in a public forum like this. But uh, I've done it before um, on streams. I've talked about this stuff before, but I've never talked about it with somebody that's obviously like a professional like yourself on a stream or like I mean on a recording but the reason I'm doing this is because I want other Zoids to see how some of the stuff in our childhood might impact the way we adapt to a lot of the stuff we adapted to uh, especially a lot of the Zoids out there that have done some, some reading some of the literature and kind of have read about like how developmental stuff and how our past and everything might you know transform some of those things into these adaptations but there's outside of that it's it, i think it would be interesting to show kind of an example of how that stuff kind of could develop uh, at least according to your own um, uh, um thoughts and professional opinion so on and so forth so you, you kind of get my gist uh, i, I do what, how shall i re what do you want from me do you want to speak uninterrupted do you no no i interrupt questions? me all you want so questions, okay. interruptions, uh, I, and, and, and I know you had mentioned uh, prior to this that like you didn't want to like dig too too deeply because, you know, it might be too personal or something. Did you say something like yeah, that? Yeah, I'm here. Oh. I'm learning to be cautious. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry about that with this because the, the, the reason the reason I say don't worry about that with this is because this is more important than that. Um, this is like I've abstracted out of like any personal issues, like when it comes to this stuff, like I'm already gone. I, I, I put on a pedestal or uh, if there's a hierarchy of value, um, the, what people get out of this conversation, what people get out of um, hearing this sort of stuff is far more important to me than any kind of personal discomfort uh, that, you know, talking about these things may cause. And at this point, after doing this for like a year or so, um, I don't really get much discomfort out of talking about anything. So anything you say or bring up, anything that pops into your head that you want to mention um, or you want to relate back to your uh, your understanding. So you can talk meta, basically. Like if you want to talk uh, about, you know, whether it's masters and stuff, whether it's client stuff, whether it's anything else and associated to what we're discussing and um, everything else, you can do that. So it's I'm very still back at rose of citrus. What happened? I'm still back at, do I wear rose? Do I wear citrus? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. But, but in any case, like point is you can okay. relate it back to whatever you want. Play sure. with it. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm a subject right now and uh, you don't have to worry about me. I'll be fine. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, okay. conveying that to you. I will be fine Thank so you. that you feel comfortable uh, with the situation. Okay. So how would you normally start something like this as far as what is one of the first questions that you think I should answer when it comes to like trying to figure out what is this guy's childhood? What is this well, guy? I don't um, think like that. Okay. Well, how do you think it will start? Um, I, I think around connection first of connecting okay. to you. And, um, you know, usually the first things that I say to people in the beginning is I teach them how to orient me and the listener if they want to. And what I ask is um, that we take a minute, not that's really too long, maybe five seconds just to be here together. So okay. that now we're here in the same room and we're not outside where we were two minutes ago. And then I'll, I would ask you, what do you take a moment and see if you know what you're feeling now and mm -hmm. also what you want from me to orient me for and you've already done some of that yeah i tried to do that as much as Actually, I, could, right? I i work back i work from the present i'm a gestalt therapist mm -hmm. so i don't automatically um people 
sort of unfold in their own way. Oh, I can definitely, I definitely do that. That's yeah. why I want to make this as natural and organic as possible. Yeah. So, so for me, it would be, um, orient you've oriented me that you want to talk. Here's how I'm taking it. So we'll pretend. So I, I'm oriented that mm -hmm. I feel it's really important to put out your history, not only for your sake, but least of all for your sake, because you know your own history. Yeah, but I know my so history. So that there's a model for other people who are listening to mm -hmm. be comfortable maybe a little more in their own history and, yes. and feel a little bolder like they're, and not so much alone. And no, then, for sure. And then maybe like, uh, you know, as this sort of stuff develops, if they can find, and that's the difficulty is finding a therapist or a psych that basically has a better understanding of this stuff and some of the stuff you teach as well um, so that they can maybe one day be able to find the confidence to open up in a, sim <clears throat> in a similar fashion with a professional uh, yeah, that could help them. And I think one of the hardest parts, at least from reading people online in Quora, is they do open up. And I, as the therapist or whoever the therapist, we're, we're talking different languages and we don't. The biggest complaint is somebody opens their heart and I don't realize it or the therapist doesn't realize it. Or we don't understand. They say, this is really important when I'm telling you. And we nod and I can grasp it's important. Uh, on a conceptual level, but since I'm not in the same emotional space, something of my reaction is often wanting or feels inadequate to the person, uh, except when I understand them ac accidentally almost, and yeah, then yeah. it feels great. Then they're really excited and they're jumping around and, oh my God, something. Yeah, yeah, it is exciting. It can be exciting. My, my, <laughs> my own psych did that a few times um, unintentionally, and then she was kind of taken aback, like, oh, why is he so excited? And I'm yeah. like, um, that's because you, you got it. You got the thing I was trying to say, even though it took a while. Um, so so that, that's where I am. Whereas, you know, um, uh, I'm hoping to be up to it. And oh, okay. Up to the <laughs> challenge. Up to the yes. challenge. And yeah. I know how difficult um, it can be to find the right level of me. It, 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 it was interesting, um, you know, in texting with you and Verb, and then I'll go back to you and in, in your childhood. One of you landed on my area, the area, I think it was verb of medium abstraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meet meet in the middle. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's actually one of the things that uh, I talked to uh, Zoids about too, is that sometimes if you want to interact with people, you have to kind of meet them. Uh, on a different playing field because like um you gotta meet them in the middle because you can't because a lot of the times we'll just come, we'll want to come up to somebody and just kind of say things that sound kind of like out of context and without kind of uh, background of why it is we're saying what we're saying, but because it makes it, it makes sense in our heads, but it might not necessarily make sense to the person listening. And uh, we have to kind of try to think about how we can meet that person in the middle a little bit to, to explain things and have the patience for it. So. So what I would ask here would be, what do you want to tell me about yourself that is important to you and that you think is important to other people? And you can tell it your own way. And if I don't understand or if there's something important that I'm not understanding, I'll interrupt. No, absolutely. Go back. Absolutely. So in, in a funny way, that it's not so funny, that that's how I would do it. What's mm. most natural for me would be to let you do it in your own way and then well, ask questions see that's the odd part is um like as far as when i'm talking about my childhood and things of that nature like i have a lot of gaps of memory gaps i have a lot of um, things i do remember a significant amount of stuff it's just kind of in like the timeline is a little unsure for me uh of certain things um and so it, it can be a little difficult to to discuss only because of that uh, not so much because of the any emotional attachment I have to you know specific events or things, and and this is something I often hear with Zoids when they talk about their past or they try to they they it feels like yeah like a little alien to them or it feels like there was some moment in time where maybe they didn't prior to some of these adaptations developing that they remember having more feelings about things, but they don't remember what that felt like. And they don't remember what that was like. They just have a memory of acting or being different 
uh, in early childhood, um, as far as like, you know, the uh, being uh, active or wanting to participate in things type, they'll, they'll describe like having memories of, and I have the same of, of being more excited to be alive, <laughs> I yeah. guess is the, is the, um, is I guess the best way I can put it. Uh, so if I can think back, um, I mean, if I, it, my earliest memory, I guess that's the classic way to go, right? Um, earliest, earliest memory. I try, I, I think about this often, but it's, it's kind of difficult. For some reason, my earliest memory has nothing to do with my parents. Um, it has, and most of my memories have nothing to do with my parents. Uh, it mostly has to do with whatever activities I was doing or I was distracting myself or entertaining myself with as a child. Um, in my case, it was having, people are probably going to laugh when they hear this, but it was having an Atari 2600, which was the old Atari game. Remember mm -hmm. like, yeah, I had the old stuff like Pac-Man and, and, you know, all the old games, right? And I remember that is like my, one of my earliest memories. I was probably like maybe three or four years old. And I remember I had the little joystick in my hand with the little red button on top. And I would sit there and I would play Miss Pac-Man for hours. Um, and really enjoyed that for whatever reason. Um, and I didn't really go outside and play with the kids or anything like that. I don't have, <clears throat> I have some recollection of doing that kind of stuff, but I don't remember what I did or uh, I remember I would just talk about this and that. Uh, I'm not sure what, but I was just yammering all the time when I was around other kids. Um, but I didn't, um, but I was, but it was interesting because I wasn't yammering because I wanted to like, um, it didn't, from what I can recall, it wasn't me trying to talk to them because I wanted to make friends necessarily. It was more like I wanted to talk about these things that I thought were exciting or interesting. And I really wanted to talk to people. And, and when I wasn't talking to people about something I thought was fun, um, I would just go back to playing video games uh, on my Atari or later on my Nintendo. But uh, oddly, um, I don't have like any recollections of my parents, like my parents' faces, what we did together when I was really little. Later on, I have some stuff, but um, it, all of it's kind of gone, um, maybe because I never connected to it to begin with, but I, I'm not entirely sure. And I, I'm curious to what your thoughts on that are, why, why that, that is, a, and I'm not the only one either. Uh, I've talked to a few Zoids, they have this kind of issue as well of lacking certain levels of memories because of, of a lack of connectivity to those whatever events were partaking or taking place back then? A lot of people I see and uh, lack memories, uh, not just Lloyd's. Mm -hmm. I don't know that probably for different reasons. Um, yeah. A friend of mine's mother said she didn't remember anything before the age of 21. That was the, uh, she ended up committing suicide. Jeez. Wow. You know, so I, obviously there was a lot of trouble. You know, we can we can kind of date things loosely from what people remember and yeah. what they responded to. People tend to remember more bad things than good things in general. I think that's yeah, yeah. logical. So yours without having the, the, the I, I identify with your excitement of wanting to talk about something rather than trying to find uh, a friend. I, I think I wanted both, but I think friends were more later. Mm -hmm. And um, developmentally, kids do a lot of parallel play where they don't really, um, they don't do something together yet. They oh, okay. Do, do I think I did. All, I think it was all parallel play with her. I mean, um, as far as like, um, I remember, like, I can't, I don't remember ever wanting to take part in uh, like there was no memories of me taking part in activities uh that i found interesting with other kids um i just wanted to share ideas and share th my thoughts about this or that tv show or video game or movie question. i watched question do yeah. you remember some of the specifics of what you wanted to share then um probably like you know whatever challenge and if it's a video game or whatever thing i'm trying to do pertaining to it or what i like and don't like about it 
basically what I like and don't like about a variety of interesting things that I thought were interesting when I was a kid, whatever those things may have been. A lot of those things probably ranged from, you know, like I said, a piece of media that I was interacting with or something I'm reading in a book or, uh, or something I saw on TV or something I saw somewhere and it had, it made me like thoughts popped into my head and I wanted to, talk, I wanted to share those thoughts with others. Did yeah. you have any idea of what type of character you wanted to be or um, like when I was little, I remember once I figured out I was female and going to be small relatively mm -hmm. and I wanted to be big and powerful and a bully, I would yeah. watch Tina clean of the jungle and she had two leopards which or whatever she had and that seemed like a good way to go. You know, oh, okay. So you're asking. Or at, at maybe three years old, play, pretending I was Sheena with my leopards. Yeah. And um, since my aunts were in the room and one didn't wear underwear, um, I learned some other things. Okay. Well, that, there you go. Jeez. <laughs> so with you, with me wanting to, my, you know, like I remember wanting uh, being attracted to um, feral children, you, you know. Uh, like Mowgli, Jungle Book. Exactly, I read, and when, as soon as I could read, I read every book about kids read, you know, who they thought were raised by wolves and turned out to be probably either autistic or zoid or abandoned or things. So, so did you have a theme going then? Like I had some themes. Theme. Okay, actually I probably, um, I probably had some kind of theme. I mean, get as I got a little bit older, probably like four or five years old, I'm guessing it, it was always an interest or fascination with uh, things like heroes or superheroes or like being someone that could protect uh, themselves and others in some regard. Um, but I also liked scary, spooky things, even as a kid. So I liked heroes that were scary. I like heroes that were kind of anti-heroes I guess would be a good point they're kind of like good guys but they acted like bad guys so so um I always thought those kind of characters were something I wanted to simulate um I wanted to be like the uh, like the good I wanted to be a good person but I didn't want to I didn't I want to still be like myself like I didn't want to like I don't know how to explain it like there was this distance between like uh you know the the superhero and the people they're saving right so it was kind of like like even even the good ones like even the ones that aren't scary like even spider-man like spider-man was something i liked when i was really really little right i had my mom would get me um the comic books at the liquor store whatever they had like these little side on you know on where they used to have magazine racks or whatever and they would sometimes have spider-man comics and x-men comics and i would ask my mom if I could have them and then she would occasionally buy me one and I would I would read that you know Spider-Man comic over and over and over and over um it would get to the point where like the the the, the comics themselves would just start kind of not looking too great after a while because I would just read them again and again um and I would just get something out of reading them and I think it was from from what I can recall and what I can surmise is that it was this idea of I can take part in things and be a good thing, but at the end of the day, you know, this is a secret identity or whatever, and I can go back to my, my own private area. Like, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm here, I'm Spider-Man. I beat up the bad guys, I save the day, and then everyone's like, good job, Spider-Man, and then I go, goodbye citizens and then just take off you know and then i'm gone and they don't bother me anymore and they don't have to like find out about me because i'm separate because uh if that makes sense and i think i was always really interested in that idea because every every time that was what i wanted to do i wanted to play video games that had heroes in them i wanted to read comic books i wanted to read stories that had heroes in them that were more like separate from the people they were saving or interacting with, or it, or if they were anti-heroes, like uh, I remember one in particular as a kid that I liked was Morbius the Vampire, which was, um, you know, later on, he was one of the Spider-Man villains, but later on he was a, uh, he became more of a hero, anti-hero figure. 
and I always found that interesting because he was like a scary vampire man, right? But you know, and he he needed to live off the blood of humankind, but he had like this guilt and resentment about doing it or whatever. And it was like the struggle for him, but he still wanted to save people because you know he had a good heart. But he but and so what he had to do was to live to be survive. He'd have to drink the blood of bad guys, right? Uh, or take the plasma from the bad guys and then when people would be like but people would be scared of him because he's scary he's a vampire even though he saved them and uh and so he would retreat back into the shadows even though he did something good the people that he would save would obviously reject his presence because he was they they would often think oh they were the next going to be the next victim when he had zero intention to hurt them right uh, but because he eviscerated essentially the people that were trying to hurt them, they're scared of him now. But anyway, sorry. Now, if this was therapy and I was comfortable with you and you were comfortable with me, I would ask you to try on a sentence for just to, for size. Uh, sentence. Um, well, you, you would say the let whatever the sentence was that described you like i want to be a hero but i want to be separate and i'm scary and if they saw me they'd be scared but i can save them whatever it was that you said would you would you repeat it mm -hmm. and, and and if you're willing add at the end and this is my existence oh man that's heavy okay <laughs> okay i don't think i've ever done this one uh okay so i want so i have to say i want to be fill in the yeah, blank the first and person. then this is my existence person. okay and you're that person, first person. i and you were and okay so this so this so is and and i just, am uh, real yeah related back to these are things i was describing that i had feelings of regarding uh when i was a little kid so okay i want to save people but be scary enough to where they don't want to be with me after i do that and that is my existence okay. that's weird okay and, and is that is that what you meant scared? yes and what does that feel like and what is what that what thoughts come to mind when you say it that uh way? it's kind of it's kind of weird because that's exactly blech gross okay uh sorry mm. that was effective in the sense that it made me uh it made my zoid sort of adaptations want to trigger uh and not want to talk about that any further but i'm going to no because it's like that's what i'm doing now i guess so that's what's gross about it i'm, I'm doing that now as far as like you know the server and what i'm trying to do is it's how i feel about this project and everything i'm doing right now i feel like that about it I want to help others, but I don't want them to thank me or celebrate me in any capacity. I just want to go back and retreat into the shadows. And so it makes me feel really awkward because I, I kind of was just discussing something that based on my childhood and now it relates back to my current actions. And um, that's weird. I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> No, I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I took a chance because that's really, I was being the therapist and make and mm -hmm. helping me make that connection. Yeah, a oh, while well, it was effective. Um, it's a but connection that, I'd never even put together. Interesting. Oh, go ahead. No, no. So. It, oh, okay. I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't know what to say right now about that one because that one was heavy okay. uh, and strange. Uh, because like I, I never made the connection between my interests as a child and what I'm doing right now, um, and what aesthetics or whatever I gravitated toward as a kid. Like you said, a character. Um, and it's it's weird to think that I am currently trying to live up to that character right now. That's odd. Um, without intending to do so. So yeah, hmm. that's weird. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Yeah, I feel awkward because <laughs> uh, I'm not too sure where to take it. Uh, you, you haven't actually seen me. We haven't done anything like this, so I I understand now. No, just, it's not that. It's not our interaction that's awkward. It's the I understand yeah. the direct line, the awareness. Yeah, yeah, the awareness is awkward. Mm. Now, what I did was classic gestalt therapy, old school. Old that school? Was 
old school gestalt therapy before people got super relational and, you know, making, creating a situation where an aha connection between the person and themselves could happen. And so that's what gestalt therapy was about when it started and what attracted me to it. And um, I, I wouldn't necessarily do it with somebody who identified as a Zoid who came to me. I'd be much slower. But since you said you were game for, okay, I want that so, white uh, stuff that goes down easy. Aha, vanilla ice cream. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, um, so, okay, so let's so go, I, let's go, let's continue. Let's continue. Okay. And I'm you sorry, go ahead. If you don't want me to intervene in this particular inside oriented way, I can put it to a side. It's your choice. No, you do whatever you want. Experiment with me. I don't give a shit. Like okay. I'm basically saying you experiment with me. You use whatever tactics or, or professional knowledge you have on the subject and how you you wanna do it. You just you use me as a tool for, for this purpose. I am I am here to, to for this for well, this. I'll and if it helps, if it's helpful to me in some regard, then good, good. What's I'll up? make an observation. All right. You, you have, were successful in realizing that child's life plan. That's weird. Okay. <laughs> huh. Okay. Well, I, I wasn't necessarily going to be. Uh, I haven't, I hadn't been for a long time. Uh, but I am now starting to work on that. Something there. Um, I think, is there a connection issue? Okay, hold on. Oh, I'm right here. No, I'm just think we're okay. Oh, okay, that's fine. It's just on my end, like, it, it looks like the connection was acting kind of funny because you froze for, like, a second, but then you're back. It looks like you're okay. good. I'm okay, back. it looks like you're good. Um, okay, that's heavy. That's interesting. All right, so we're, okay, so uh, I guess I can move on to, like, a different part of my childhood that we can, and then we can just go from there and connect whatever you want. Okay, I'll tell you some some not so great memories. Uh, definitely had uh, instantly uh, about something or another. I don't remember the details of what it was, but I remember the holidays were especially bad um, because people would imbibe and uh, they would get into these big altercations. Uh, nothing physical, but it was always like this kind of like blame guilt type thing that was happening. I know that much was occurring. Like they were blaming each other for something or another. And I, it was often related to um, me or my sister when she was born, because um, she's like two years younger than me. Uh, and then the stressors in the household. And I think my dad making promises that he wasn't keeping all kinds of stuff, or at least was being accused of that. And But I, I don't remember any details, but I remember I have memories of that sort of those instances. I also have memories of uh, retreating essentially into my interests in order to get away from that stuff because I didn't, well, wasn't interested and I didn't see a, any value in it. I do have some memories of interacting with my sister when we were really little where I would actually play with her or um, do things with her. But even then, like it wasn't often, it was usually me doing my own thing. But I, I remember she would sit with me uh, and watch me play video games or or read my comics or she would try to like replicate whatever it is I was doing because, you know, that's what kids do. And um, and I was the older child. So I have some recollection of that. Um, the the real bad stuff didn't happen until I think at least that I remember until I was older, though there is one recurring theme when it comes to my father that's interesting, um, is this disappointment uh, that I often had because, and I always relate it back to a specific set of instances, which are birthdays and Christmases, anything present related, right? Uh, and it would always kind of be a situation in which um, oftentimes, it didn't always turn out this way, but oftentimes it would be, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I like. I would express that at some point to my parents. My parents probably didn't understand my interests or really comprehend why I would have them or, or, or it dug deeply into what they are. And so then um, when, you know, it would come time for a present giving, often the things that I had asked 
for or I related to them that I was interested in would not appear in my presence. That would cause me a certain level of disappointment and discomfort because I think it was like a, a disconnect in the sense that or misattunement in the sense that it's like, oh, okay, so they didn't listen to what I said. Like they didn't care about the things that actually interest me. They just ended up getting me things that they think kids would like my age, maybe. Generic. Yeah. So like things people would like my age maybe or or if i said oh i really like this game or i'm very excited about this game that's coming out and i would try to express that to them um i don't think it would register very well because then when it would come time for me to and i would be sitting there going in my head in my little kid head i'd be going oh i had mentioned this a few times i am excited about getting it i hope i get it and then it wouldn't be that it would be some other game that i didn't say i wanted or talked about and then it would just be like, and I know some people would say, oh, you're just being ungrateful, right? But it wasn't even, um, it wasn't about getting something. It was about getting, like, I, I think I would have rather have gotten nothing than, than getting the incorrect thing. Because um, it, was, it was just like a feeling of, oh, they didn't hear me. They didn't, nobody listened. Huh, like. Maybe and maybe I was explaining it in a way that they didn't really get what I was trying to say. Who knows? Um, but but point is, I, I always tie back those moments of disappointment as being very, very uh, deep for me as a child. Uh, this is disappointment during any kind of any kind of ceremony or ritual in which the parents were supposed to convey uh, an interest or an understanding of me as a child. I like, you know. Yeah, I can understand that. I'm wondering how many of us have similar memories to that because um, I, I wasn't, my inner life and what interested me, my parents had no idea of, really. Yeah. Even if I had tried as many times as I might, even if I tried to convey it, I think, um, you know, what they gave me showed a lack of, I mean, I got melamine doll dishes and I wanted a knife and IBM. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, you know, I want a pogo stick. So, you know, I was thinking of that when you were talking that you, yeah. you, you were at least at that age, um, hadn't given up yet. You no, were I, I hadn't oh. given up. And what's interesting though, is that like the reasons for the disappointment are really kind of different uh it wasn't i wasn't disappointed so much i was more disappointed in not receiving the object i associated to comfort or whatever but not so much that like i associated comfort to my parents uh and so it, and it's kind of funny that way it was like i was almost viewing my parents as a, as a vehicle to getting the things that made me feel better or comfortable or interested in me uh, less than actually like, you know, feeling appreciative that I'm getting anything at all um, or caring about the holiday itself. Like, it's not like, oh, you didn't give me a gift at Christmas or birthday. It was like, oh, this is a time when people give gifts and this is what people say gift giving means. So uh, I guess that's how it works. And so then I would get gifts that weren't associated to anything or, or the things that I was as directly, unless like, unless the object I asked for was very concrete and very obvious, I guess sometimes that would happen. But even then it would just, and I would, I remember I would get frustrated because it would just be either it'd be a monetary thing where it's like, oh, um, oh no, it wasn't usually a monetary thing. It was a, it was a lack of care or a thing because it would be like oh um i couldn't get that thing that you wanted because they ran out or i couldn't get a hold of this thing because the store i went to didn't have it what's the mask um, what was your take I, and i don't know how true any of that was but i remember i would just get resentful because i would be like what i told you a long time ago that i was interested in this like why would why would you do it last minute? Like, I, I remember, I, even as I got older, I'd be like, why would you wait till the last minute to try to get this thing? And now you failed to get it. Why wouldn't you try to get that a long time ago? Why would you wait till like 
you know a day or two before and then all and then and then just disappoint me like and, and, and like it, it would just be this feeling i would it, it would be the resentment would be concentrated on that it wouldn't really be on the the fact that i didn't receive the object i wanted i have a question mm -hmm. um in their own life as best as you could remember as a child was your father like that like very last minute Oh, all the time. Yeah, all the time. But he was also a person that made uh, promises a lot uh, that weren't getting that wouldn't get fulfilled, um, mostly because, well, the excuses or the reasons given would be um, things uh, supposedly outside of their control. So it'd be like, oh, you know, I, I was too busy and I didn't get it back then and I try to get it now and now it's all gone. Or uh, I was to this or I was to that. And so I couldn't get it and, or I didn't find it or, you know, there would be like this lack of effort and a uh, lack of um, interest in actually accomplishing the tasks till it became apparent, I guess, that they had to be accomplished and then it would just not get accomplished or they wouldn't want to put in the actual effort or energy to accomplish whatever it was. Um, yep. Question. <clears throat> most of the focus seems to be on your father here oh yeah no for sure for sure it, it will always be i can i can assure you that when you talked earlier and you couldn't mm -hmm. you were talking about hearing your parents argue and mm -hmm. what you spoke about then was mm -hmm. your father in a way just it sounded like he was disappointing your mother yeah no absolutely that was an ongoing theme um when it came to my father, the ongoing theme was disappointment uh, and then him providing excuses for why those disappointments were not necessarily their fault. Even though oftentimes it was due to things that were preventable or could have been um, calculated, but were not for whatever reason. Um, and then oftentimes there'd be like this kind of grandiose promises uh, of things uh, that I know now he promised a lot of things to my mother uh, and then he would promise us children things and those things could wouldn't wouldn't uh, happen and it, it wasn't so much a situation where or it, it would just be a lot of promises a lot of promises and a lot of excuses and a lot of promises and a lot of excuses over and over and over um, and that just kind of became the the reoccurring theme when it comes to my father uh, I would say my can mother I, is a different story. So. Okay. Can I, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. In the model of the world you hold today, mm -hmm. how big a part of that model um, is disappointment? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of it. Um, uh, in the sense that um, I, but I, my disappointment has over the years, like, as we've discussed, this whole thing has kind of abstracted out into like larger, broader categories. Um, and that's what I'm working on now to, you know, remedy. But um, it's uh, basically that same disappointment uh, carried into uh, me looking at human behavior and studying people and being interested in history as, as a teen and being interested in, you know, the humanities um, and things like that. And then just seeing that this sort of disappointment, I started extending it to like everything. Um, and essentially, you know, at a certain point, I was just disappointed with existence and everything it doesn't provide and everything that isn't there, uh, that could be there potentially, but isn't because of, uh, you know, what I often feel are ridiculous and absurd reasons um, that are just, you know, avoidable, similar to like, you know, um, my, my father having avoidable um, ways to not disappoint, but still not doing them. And I think seeing humanity or seeing people do this continuously is, um, it might be connected to that in some regard. But, but, but of course, a lot of it has to do with like my own perceptions of how people interact and why people do things. Since I'm not really motivated by the same things um, I might I just not be understanding why they make these decisions, but uh, in my inability or my lack of understanding of why they make these kind of disappointing decisions in combination with this whole disappointment stuff in general, 
yeah, I've, I've, I've have this relationship with the world around me that is fueled by a sense of kind of disappointment and, um, you know, sadness, uh, I would say. I'm, like imagine, everything. I'm imagining asking you mm -hmm. if you would like to scream, stop disappointing me. If I would, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, it wouldn't help me. Uh, that would probably just make me feel uncomfortable and weird and it wouldn't make me feel good at all okay. uh, uh it's it's more like that, that's just not how i i express that sort of stuff okay um, it's more it's more internalized it's more like i, I, I but i've come to terms with that disappointment type stuff in the sense that um it's just like okay well that's just how it is um unfortunately people make bad decisions people do things that are just not good for them or anybody else around them. And um, I do, I've done that, some stuff like that too. And, and what can you do? Um, not everyone's going to self-reflect and not everyone's going to go through the steps of coming to terms with their own, I guess, quote unquote, sins of the past. Um, they're just going to keep on chugging along and repeating the same process over and over and over. And when you have, you know, millions of people doing that very thing all the time, then obviously you end up with a humanity that's doing it as a collective uh, uh, disappointing, disappointing action and disappointing behavior. Can I add um, an abstraction? No, absolutely. Do. You don't have to ask, just do it. Well, I'm used to asking. No, of course, of course. I'm but, sorry. You know, um, in it, I'm going to do a little gestalt therapy theory. Okay, do it. And this is for... Zoids listening in and for yourself, if, it, if, if you find it useful, is that there's basically something the Gestalt psychologists noticed. They were German psychologists caught in World War II who ended up doing a lot of, why do we see things the way we do? How do we choose? Why do we see things to, as belonging together in a group and these things not in the group? And in in gestalt therapy it becomes figure ground. Like there's too much data for our senses. There's too much, there's too much of everything. Everything is happening at once. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things to focus on interpersonally and non-interpersonally that we, are we automatically have a system set up in our brain that starts early in childhood based on what we're attracted to, what we want, what we need in the moment and what we fear and what's unfinished for us that still is pressing for fulfillment. So we're going through the world and what the imprint of these early experiences will have an effect in what auto, this happens automatically and our unconscious mind starts prioritizing certain things, which means we're gonna notice them more than something else that's also going on. And my guess is something very early on with your dad, especially, and I haven't heard about your mother yet, if you don't mind me making guesses, prioritize disappointment for you so that you can see it super easily. You can you can hone in on it where it happens in the world better than someone else. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Disappointment. I, I am a disappointment radar. That's right. And this would be the underlying abstract way that the brain starts to prioritize. And we can also train it to prioritize other stuff. I mean, a lot of what therapy is, is, re, is looking at the, our brain almost like a software app or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We, we've, we've programmed or been programmed without our being aware of it from early childhood. And now the programming is still running exactly the same until we bring it into awareness and start to make a decision. Oh, I want to update this in this way, or you know, I'm going yeah, to you got to patch up. it. I guess the term would be to patch your, your software. You'd be patching your software uh, and getting updates on it in order to make improvements okay. to its efficiency. So what I'm hearing from you is that the disappointment software went in really early, prioritized oh, yeah. disappointment because it was so painful that eventually it's like expect disappointment, look for disappointment. I, I know in my case, um, you know, after a few disappointments, you know, that I remember, uh, I didn't, my conclusion wasn't that I'll always be disappointed. My conclusion was I'm going to have to get what I want for myself. And other people aren't going to be particularly interested or aware 
or even understand, um, you know, so it, it didn't register. So I didn't prioritize. So even though it was a massive disappointment, um, what I took from it was a different way of seeing the world, which was, how am I going to have fun? <laughs> how am I going to manage to have things in my life that I'm interested yeah, yeah. in? And that became the dilemma rather than the focus on disappointment. So I'm hearing for you something coalesced around disappointment, whereas mm -hmm. for me, a similar situation, of course, not the same, um, coalesced on me detaching from the adults to some extent as givers of what I want or need, you know, and, and, um, and this is, yeah, this, this brings me to another point because um. Okay, so I'm gonna this this brings me to the, another point of my childhood that is relevant. Another set of disappointments that aren't associated directly uh, from my parents, but to the external world as a whole, um, as a child. So during school time, you know, because you know, as a child, you'd spend a good portion of your day at school. That similar pattern of disappointment would happen, but for different reasons. Or I would get punished for things, or I perceived it at least as punishment for things that I felt that I wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, and that is what kind of led eventually to me being categorized as a child with ADD, right? I remember just a lot of memories of essentially me being in class, me interrupting class with thoughts, ideas, things that would pop into my head that were in more interesting to me than what is being discussed. Um, or if there would be one part of the thing a teacher said, or the book said, or whatever, that would... I find interesting, I would start talking about that instead. Or if I had a personal interest that I'd rather be talking about or discussing, like as I mentioned, you know, things that I wanted to talk to people about, I would start talking about that instead and ignore the class or ignore the lessons or whatever it is that I was being taught. So um, it would often end up with me being like the class, um, that I would often be a class clown slash interrupter. Uh, because I was so uninterested in what was happening it, as far as within the confines of the classroom itself. Like I wanted to do other things. And so, um, so I would express that or I would say things or I would whatever. And often, uh, yeah, I would get in trouble for, for being disruptive or being, um, or, or not staying on task. That was often the word that was used. I wasn't staying on task, you know, and any report card I would get, as a kid, it would be like, oh, he's doing great in every aspect except for citizenship. Like, so I, I would get my homework done. I would, you know, I would learn fast. I was a quick learner, quick reader, quick everything. But the staying on task or the citizenship, as they called it back then, I don't know if they still call it that, um, it would always be abysmal um, because of these problems. And so that would often get me ostracized. Uh, in the sense that, you know, here you have to go sit in the corner or you have to go sit over there and be quiet. Um, that or, you know, conversations that my parents would be forced or have to sit through, you know, where they would talk about how I'm being disruptive or I'm not paying attention, which would in turn translate into things like uh, spanking, you know, other forms of um, corporal punishment and, and so on and so forth and whatever attempts they were using at discipline that they believed would somehow fix uh, this not staying on task problem. Um, but, you know, as we discussed before, it's, it's unfortunate because the reason I wasn't staying on task wasn't because I couldn't focus. I just wasn't interested in what they wanted me to focus on. I know that now. Uh, and so I was punished for it. And that kind of created further disappointment in the institutions that I take part in. Um, and why I'm taking part in it and the frameworks that were built around me. Like, this is how things are done. This is how stuff is learned. This is how, these are the motions you have to go through. So I, I became incredibly um, rebellious on, in an internal fashion. Um, I didn't really externalize my rebellion very much, but internally I built up this kind of resentment and confusion and so on and so forth because I didn't understand what I was doing wrong, but I started being taught that whatever, whatever I was doing, it was wrong. Um, it shouldn't be that way. And so that in association with the stuff with my dad and my mother uh, is an interesting person too, because she's, I have a lot less resentment toward her because she was more of a person that was 
legitimately trying her best with a few tools she had um but she just didn't know how to work with a child like me um so you know she attempted to do what she would read or see would be good for a child and those things were just not the things i needed um and some of the stuff i did need or want or ask for were things that she associated with maybe not being good for a child you know she was like essentially the mother that you know would believe that you know video games are probably bad for you she's the mother that would believe that you know too much tv or too much this or too much that is bad for you or this kind of music is not good for you um she was like the classic sort of like mother that believed whatever the world was telling her about what's good and bad about for a child and she would kind of do that um and so she would like if, if that makes sense she kind of uh, was very much yeah. externally controlled when it comes to parenting I had a question about your perception of them as intelligent human beings. Did you feel they were intelligent? No, no, they were definitely not intelligent human beings. Um, I never, I never perceived, even as a child, I always saw my parents as kind of like, just not intelligent in the sense that like, I would try to discuss things with them or I would try to bring things up to them that were interesting. And, you know, the, my mother would praise me for, oh, it's like, oh, I have a smart child, but you know, she was always proud that I was a smart child, but I could never really have conversations about a lot of stuff with them because they either didn't know about it or weren't interested, or they, they would say they were too busy for, for those types of conversations. So no, I, know, I never perceived my parents as particularly competent in my mind, uh, in the, in, at least in the realms that I cared about. Maybe they were competent in realms that I was in, in interested in, but uh, as a child, the realms I cared about um, yeah, I didn't see any kind of competence or interest uh, in, in their behavior, uh, for sure. So I, I know uh, that resentment uh, grew to a head, especially once high school, you know, perceiving my parents as less like incompetent in the sense that like they didn't want to learn about anything in any significant capacity. Um, they just wanted to kind of chug along, which to me was just not a good way to be. Um, anyway. I'm not sure where to take all this, but, uh, but it also, it also, um, that stuff that I was talking about, that behavior. That it, I, was I have a question. Yeah. The same words that you used about your parents. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to say it now and assign it to some part of society today, mm -hmm. could you say those same words? And would it yeah, absolutely. That? So would I, would, I, would, I would say, cause that's the thing, like, once you start noticing patterns of behavior, I guess I started like my radar started kind of like picking it up everywhere else around me. And I'm like, why, why do people do this? Why do people like this? So, so um, a combination of like, you know, the stuff that was happening at school, I'm getting punished for things that I thought, why am I, why am I getting punished? So it's like, okay, so that, that combined with the disappointment at home and then, uh, and it wasn't in, a, in, and it became, it extended to the interpersonal too, because outside of the classroom, outside of like an authority figure that was uh, telling me that my behavior was incorrect, uh, even my peers as a child in middle school um, were telling me my behavior was incorrect because uh, I would be bullied, I would be mistreated by, uh, I would be an easy target for certain people um, to to get whatever they wanted out of me in the sense that, you know, they grab my stuff, they would throw it on a rooftop, they would throw my things in trash cans, so on and so forth. And I would have like a lack of response to it um, because I guess I expected that. And so um, I would just get my stuff and out of the trash or off of wherever, and I would just go about my day. Uh, and I would just continue like that. And I, I, I got bullied significantly. Um, and I think it had to do with my behavior, like, you know, the way I was always talkative or the way I was nerdy or always wanted to, you know, talk about this or that, you know, nerdy would probably be the easiest way to describe it. I was a nerdy kid. Uh, and that made me an easy target. Um, bullied by boys and girls or just by boys? I think both, but mostly boys. Uh, but both, I think I would say both to a varying degree. I would get made fun of by girls probably when I was in middle school, but I would get bullied more by bullies. So uh, like physically bullied. So yeah, it was bullied probably by both, but one was more, you know, um, mockery and the other one was more physical. 
the boys would be the physical bullies where they would push me or you know punch my arm or th throw my stuff on the ground or make me spill things you know classic bully 1980s style bully stuff but I remember when it would happen, it wouldn't just be like I'd be going home in tears. It would be more like, oh, this is just expected. This is what people do. And then if I told my parents this stuff, it would, they would obviously respond with, well, that shouldn't be happening. And the school should do something about it. And I'm going to have a word with the teacher. And like my mom would do that. My dad, I don't remember. Uh, she would probably have to bug him to make him do that stuff because he probably didn't want to. Um, but Did you have a word with your teacher? Yeah, I remember they would work with my teachers when it came to the stuff. I think they would talk to the teacher. But in my head, I probably thought, oh, this isn't going to accomplish anything. Like, I probably didn't expect anything to change. And it didn't. It didn't change. Because this stuff was happening outside of the realm of the teacher's purview, right? Bullies aren't stupid. Bullies, bullies know when to do what they do, not get caught. Um. And so after a while, it just became a situation in which I just stopped reporting it uh, because it was like, okay, well, it's not going to change. So reporting it is just a big waste of time. So why report it? Um, it's not going to, the behavior is not going to alter. And I wasn't even the one reporting it because I wanted it to change. I didn't expect it to change. So I was just reporting it because, you know, that's, I get my, my mother would ask, like, why is your backpack all messed up? Or why is there, you know, your, why is your papers ripped? And I would say, oh, somebody ripped them. Question. Yeah. Does reporting or not reporting play a role in your life today? It used to. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it would just be like, oh, why report this? Why report that? It's just going to be, it's just going to bring back again disappointment. It's going to be ignored or misunderstood, especially. I think that's the key word is misunderstood. Um, it wasn't so much ignored because sometimes it would be explored. It would be listened to. Or it would be heard, but not listened, I guess, is like what people usually like to say. So the stuff I would report would be like acknowledged as it existing, but the way it would be approached or tackled would be incorrect or uh, misattuned. And I would just be like, okay, well, that achieved nothing. So, so we'll only ask for, before we go back to things, mm -hmm. and you could be recording this, is okay. feedback so far what it's like for you to be do, talking about this and feedback on what I'm asking or not asking? Well, as far as how I'm feeling, for sure, this is going to, talking about these things isn't the, the part that messes me up. It's like all the stuff I associate to it, right? Mm -hmm. That disappointment as a, as a more meta thing. Uh, so, you know, uh, relating to that stuff and thinking about it and then associating it to just my uh, existence as a whole and how the patterns kind of develop. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be pretty wrecked for the day. I, I'll guarantee you that much. <laughs> so, but it's not any fault of your own. That's just how these sort of things. And I want to want to convey that to people listening is, you know, talking about these things, getting into them. And if you find a, a therapist or somebody that actually knows how to talk to you, um as a zoid or whatever um yeah it's gonna wreck your day um when you when uh you get into some of this stuff and you start because it, it, what's funny is that what might wreck your day isn't necessarily what your therapist or your psych is telling you it's the kind of discoveries and thoughts that you uh, make and explore on your own because uh, that's one thing uh that isn't i think discussed and it's important to bring up is that a lot of zoids do the therapy they do like 50 percent of the therapy by themselves with the help of the professional and that's what i did with mine it would just be like she would ask me the right questions guide me in the right ways help me get to certain places um and then i would just be pondering those things for you know days at a time at different intervals and it's those moments of pondering and unpacking and packing and so on that you're doing that you actually get to sometimes get to where you need to so even if um, you do the session and it feels like, well, what was the point of that? I don't feel like it went anywhere. It's like, yeah, don't, don't do that. Um, think about, uh, about some of the stuff that was discussed and the ideas that were being, um, I'm not saying to ruminate on it in a, a, to a, a completely bad point, but um, sometimes that, that thing tends to happen that sometimes you can make a breakthrough by yourself. Um, as, as you zoids know, nobody understands your inner world like you do, and nobody ever will.
but in that case that, that that's why you have to be your own best friend when it comes to or your own therapist when it comes to um trying to work with the stuff that your actual therapist helped you get to because it, it, you might not be able to do it during the session itself those breakthroughs oftentimes at least in my case didn't happen during the session they happened after the session a day or two later and then I would come back to my psych and be like, I made a breakthrough mentally um, about this or that. And then she'd be like, she'd be surprised because she'd be like, oh, wow. Like, okay, you made a lot of progress. Well, between now and last week. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I did. Because I'd been thinking about this nonstop um, and I made some progress. And so it's funny, the, like, the, the most progress you make will be when you're not in the session. In fact, the, the session itself might feel like, what, what did that accomplish? And then, and then you'll make that breakthrough later on your own. So it, it's still very independent, it's still very much autonomous. So don't, don't worry, guys, you're not getting hijacked by your psych, at least hopefully not. <laughs> no, um, and if here, um, if anything I'm saying, it's more like um, what I was thinking to make it useful for people who wanted to join in themselves in thinking about these things, but didn't necessarily have a therapist or ne didn't necessarily or trust them. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of Zoids don't them. trust them or is, they're categorized as a bad thing along with everything else. Like they would, they would associate in my case, it would associate um, disappointment with a professional as well. It would be like, Oh, I'm just going to get more disappointment. Yeah, so I was thinking that basically the framework might be to think of three words that you use a lot that you see everywhere in the right. world and then take those words and trace them back to your earliest memories. And mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of ribbon attaches them? What kind of rope or threads attach them? Why those three words out of the millions of things? And it'll, it'll somehow be meaningful. And as in your case, when you were talking about it, you, you know, the memories of disappointment had to do with your father and not being understood and not people, not people, people not making the extra effort that was necessary. Even the but well, it's not even extra effort, just the minimum effort, like the basic effort. But uh, like I said, a lot of it has to do with that. I was just a, and that's, that's why a lot of those, those theories and ideas that me and Bird present a lot about the way we think uh, come into play, because um, I often think about how much of it was active neglect and abuse and how much of it was also just a world's inability to interpret or understand a child like myself at that time and children like me. Uh, or children that were like me, uh, but uh, but that's you know that's a whole different convo. So this is where it gets heavy because this is what this is because oh and by the way to any Zoids watching this like if I make this opening up stuff look easier than it would be for you that's only because I've done this sort of stuff before I've practiced this sort of stuff I've come to terms with a lot of this sort of stuff I know for you guys individually if you were to do such a thing it might take sessions and sessions it might take you a year to even get as far as I just did with um with eleanor talking about it opening up about it that's fine it's going to take you as long as it takes you um and, and if you're wondering like how's he doing it like how does he just think about these things and open up like that to a stranger you know or whatever you want to perceive it as like okay i get that i get where you're coming from i'm only like i said i'm only able to do this because i've been at this for so long but you know if you're in your 20s and you're barely trying to figure some of this stuff out it's going to be hard and it's going to take time and you have to be patient and you're not going to get results like immediately, uh, you know, even if you're putting in what you feel is enough effort, it's still going to require more effort. Um, anyway, uh, this, this stuff isn't easy. Okay, so this is where it gets heavy, doctor, because um, this is where I had already pinpointed with my, my actual psych um, where the adaptations con like solidified, okay? where this is the moment in which the adaptations became just dug in. Um, and because that's what we, we me and my uh, psych did EMDR to get to this. So we were doing a lot. We did some, some EMDR. She was surprised because we did like a session of EMDR and I just uncovered a ton of stuff. And she's like, normally it takes a lot more sessions than that. And I'm like, not for me um, because I have a personality where I see cognitive dissonance. And I just bury myself in it. I just 
go straight into it. Not everyone can do that. Most people can't do that, but I do that. Uh, and I know like one other person that does the same thing and it's hard, but for some reason, I think it has to do with this kind of like, uh, like you said, that character, right? I just want to be, I want to go in there and fight um, and be the hero type figure without the praise. Um, and so I'll do that, you know, for, uh, for myself sometimes and whatever. Anyway, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't go away from scary things. I don't turn away from scary things. I go toward them. Okay. And this was a scary thing. Um, when I was seven or eight, I can't recall the actual age. I don't know if you saw my, any of my streams or whatever, where I discussed my, uh, no, I didn't. Okay. So, um, when I was a certain age, um, basically things occurred, uh, with a neighbor, um, and they were in their teens, right? Uh, and I was probably like eight or nine or something. And um, it was a boy. And they were probably like, I'm guessing 15, maybe. And for whatever reason, um, you know, my mother would let me go outside and go play with other kids or whatever. But one of these kids I was hanging out with was this boy. And he was, a, like I said, a neighbor. And, um, and it basically turned into a situation of grooming over time uh and it was it started with oh i'm your friend we're close friends whatever i'm this i'm that um oddly enough it was like the first even though it might have just like i said it was just grooming um that person made me feel as if they were trying to understand me right so because of that reason um uh i think that's like one of the earliest uh intimate sort of human connections i made as unhealthy as it was so uh because um they were probably the first person i recall was attempting to properly you know actually make take the time to understand what it is i was trying to convey or express in my me as an individual and so um obviously the grooming eventually turned into like um videos that they would show me and, um I'll, uh, interestingly enough a lot of the the things they would show me video wise the memories i have are really strange kind of even um even like as far as like you know goes they were kind of stranger ones that had like occult imagery and like like really strange stuff uh i don't i'm not sure what it was it was like some you know kind of like 80s weird stuff and um and bsm probably i don't know and so uh i was shown this stuff and i didn't really understand because i was prepubescent so i wasn't like aroused by it or uh, you know nothing was being activated uh, on that level i just thought oh this is so interesting this is such weird stuff what am i watching what is this i don't understand and and then eventually it turned into other forms of things and then eventually turned into physical activities um and so I started associating those activities um, specifically. If, if, do you mind if I, uh, I'll try, I try my best not to get uh, gruesome uh, with the, any details because I don't know how uncomfortable those things make you. I'm sure you've heard these stories before. I, I hear, you know, I'm, I've heard and thought a lot of things in my life. Okay, then you'll be fine. But basically uh, the, the particular act that I would uh, often do was um, mm -hmm. right? and so because of that I started associating that action with this person as a intimacy bond mm -hmm. um, and it was it became a situation where it wasn't you know because I was pre it wasn't sexual in nature um, it was more just intimacy and and because this person pretended essentially to really listen and understand me and it got to a point where, and I'm sorry if this is difficult for anybody listening that has a uh, past with this stuff. And if it's too difficult for you, please um, skip this part, do whatever you need to, or if you can handle it, listen to it, whatever, if, if it's triggering other stuff, I'm sorry. I probably should have, you know, but I should have warned a little bit further. further. But uh, I would actually pursue the person to do this more, right? Because it would be, oh, this is, this is what friendship and coming together it's like this is what it's supposed to be right um this feels right even though it wasn't 
and so it kind of continued on for uh you know a period of time and of course they did the normal grooming tactics of oh this is our secret this is our thing we don't tell people you know we don't share this with other people because it's special and so on and so forth and then eventually it, what's funny is that stuff th this is where it gets a little wild is that stuff isn't what triggered my adaptations right I will tell you what did. And I did for a long time think as, as I grew up, I thought um, that I thought that's what messed me up, right? Because that's what everyone told me messed me up, okay? So, so then when eventually at some point, I guess my mother suspected something, so I don't know why she would let, that's, that's a funny thing, why she would let her, you know, young son go hang out with the teenage boy. Uh, but, uh, she eventually told me like, is there something happening of this nature? And in my head, I was thinking, and I remember this, I was thinking, oh, darn, the jig is up. Uh, our fun secret is exposed. And so I said, yes, that's what's happening. And in my head, I thought, oh, oh, well, that's disappointing. It was something that I had that was private, but it turned into a, an affair, obviously of shock and horror. Uh, for my mother and everyone involved that I didn't really understand why or comprehend why it was a situation where I was like because I didn't feel any shame or guilt associated to it right not until after I was told that I there should be guilt and shame associated to it so um and so then the accusations started flying and so on and so forth and obviously this caused an even further rift between my parents um Eventually, uh, you know, I got sent to a doctor. Obviously, this caused a further rift between your parents. What made this cause a further rift? Oh, probably um, from what I can remember, it's just like, why, why weren't you there? Or who was watching him? And why wasn't, why didn't we know this is happening? And blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, so, but you know, so then at that point, they, you know, I saw a medical doctor, they want to make sure I was okay, didn't have anything. Uh, I know, I probably saw some kind of therapist or some kind or had they had me talk to somebody as a child, they made me watch videos on like VHS tapes on like how to deal with this stuff, you know, classic, classic 80s parent stuff where it's like, here's a tape, this, this will tell you how to deal with being diddled and, <laughs> and then you would watch it and you're some, and then did you watch the tape it's like yes okay do you understand it and like i guess it's like okay good <laughs> okay so well, uh, oh go ahead did it translate diddled as much as you would like Ugh. uh you know chill mode man like uh, i don't know how to say it like uh that's by the way that's internet slang for people that do that horrible stuff they call them chomos it's yeah i don't you, know I didn't, chomo I didn't. as in okay so uh, uh and so like diddled was was synonymous for being yeah yeah well not that but diddled is usually okay, that's what i was trying to get into whether yeah yeah, yeah. Diddled, diddled when somebody oh, says somebody okay. was diddled they're usually being in to some degree or, or varying degrees as a child um and so it's kind of like a way for me to say it in a casual sort of aloof fashion okay. uh so okay. um but yeah. in any case uh but yeah it's it wasn't the actual act that really fucked me up what fucked me up was uh and this is what i came to terms with with my psych and emdr and everything was that after it i was told by the world and my parents and everyone around me that what happened to me was wrong and sick and awful right and it, it it's true uh to to realistically because what that person did was wrong and sick and awful but in my mind in my little abstract or different kind of brain i was thinking oh so intimacy is wrong and sick and bad the the way i perceive intimacy the way i this positive feeling that I had, regardless of what the world explained to me was wrong, was sick and wrong and bad. And so then I categorized the whole thing as sick and wrong and bad, not just the act that was done, but the intimacy in and of itself became categorized that way. 
because as we've discussed before um you know in the number of series it's this abstraction type thing where you categorize things so it became this act is bad this act is associated to this so thus the whole thing is now bad and so then that that honestly i think created the biggest schism uh between myself and a sense of intimacy or being connecting to others because that was the first time i had connected or felt like i connected to somebody and i was told that it was wrong and it was bad and it was sick and it was terrible and um and it stayed it stayed with me right um and uh and yeah i think that was the defining moment for the adaptations to really just um because i know that after that and then into like later junior high and then high school, eventually like it just got worse and worse. Uh, especially when, um, not that's solidified, but like that's when they start, I feel like that's when they really kicked off. And then the, you know, and, and then by the time high school hit, you know, that's when people start socializing and everything. And I was still the odd kid out. I still couldn't connect to people uh, intimately. I didn't understand why people were motivated by why they were. And, and, and that's what happens in my, in my belief in high school is when you reach a point where it's like, okay, there's nothing, there's nothing here for me because um, people are doing all these things that they're saying that's what you do. And I don't connect to any of these things that are happening. I don't understand any of them. I'm not motivated by these things. Just like as a child, nobody understood me as a post uh, pubescent, uh, you know, teen. I, though even that department doesn't make sense to me. Like, it, it makes sense to me in my way, but my way doesn't make sense to anybody else. And so further disappointment, further disconnect, further this, further that. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's heavy shit. It's difficult. And it's a difficult thing to talk about with a lot of people because they can't imagine that anybody, they can't imagine conceptually the amount of damage that was done to me unintentionally by everyone around me by being told that what I, had happened to me uh, was sick, horrible, and wrong, and not taking into account any of how I felt about the situation, regardless of how true it was that what happened shouldn't have happened. Uh, I don't disagree with that, but the approach that was taken uh, is what really messed me up, in my opinion. So I, I'd like your thoughts on that. Okay, well, I was thinking that I've heard that before. Um, I had a woman come to me whose grandfather had to her and she was perfectly fine with it. She didn't get enough attention in the world. He gave her attention. He never hurt her. He touched her. I, I don't remember exactly the extent of it, but there was no pain involved. There was no forcing involved. It was their little secret. He was a kind man in most ways. You know what I mean? And yeah. There was except no in that horrible, horrible way. Yes. Well, yes. except that he was using his granddaughter for sexual gratification. Oh, However, she was not traumatized by the actual acts in any way. And what traumatized her was the discovery um, of her parents' horror and that she was supposed to hate her grandfather for this. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's 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 what that's what messed me up as so well. Um I, used, I, 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 I used to, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I used to do an odd thing. The way that I happened to find that out is I had left out a big scissor next to me and I kept seeing her look at the scissor and her eyes kept being caught by the scissor. So I had asked her what's going on. You know, I see you looking at the scissor and she says, I don't like to see scissors or knives. And I explored that. And because that gave her the idea of, wanting to kill people with a scissor or a knife mm -hmm. and you know she didn't know why and that led by a string back to um the betrayal and feeling betrayed by her grandfather feeling you know um whatever everything that wasn't worked through um was uh was processed as kind of like an inner rage mm -hmm. uh, so, and and scissors and knives became an uncomfortable thing for her to look at because uh, they represented her anger, I believe, and, and things like that. 
So I ended up doing that on purpose a lot, sometimes with people leaving out an object or something that for Could most trigger a memory or association. Well, well, just as like, like, you know, people forget to tell you things like you, you know, this was like really an important thing to talk about. No, and, absolutely. But it's know, only because I've done the work. Before, yeah, beforehand. exactly. A lot of people don't. A lot of people aren't thinking about it consciously at all. And then there's something, though, that represents it to them on an abstract level or represents yes, the feelings. Absolutely. And, and, absolutely. and on the abstract level, the knife and the, the scissor represented for a lot of people the anger at the whole thing. Yeah, and that's why to this day, too, um, anytime I see uh you know either it's a documentary or a news report or anything associated to um uh the the physical child i get so so angry i'm I'm like full of all this resentment and anger and i think a lot of it doesn't just stem from the act itself but the 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 possibility that uh, another person is going to endure or go through the confusion or go through the horror that is all of this that i went through um and so i get so mad i get so angry because it's like oh no like even if that child was saved from that situation or whatever like what if it gets mishandled or what if they don't understand them or what if that messes them up and then i start thinking about that and i get so angry and i've always had um that sort of stuff is the only thing that emotionally like can trigger me in a way that i like even i'll get um I, what's the word for it um What's the word when your body reacts a certain way, but your mind isn't really knowing why your body's doing it? They're like muscle memory kind of things. Yeah, um, I don't know the exact word, but you just... Yeah, but like if I start seeing something like... If I start watching a documentary on like a, you know, like a, something, some kind of like FBI staying on a... Or something, right? Like I'll see something like that and I'll watch it and like... It's and like day. Yeah, yeah. I'll start having like, you know, tears start rolling down my face. And uh, I'll just like, but I'll sit there as a Zoid, I'll just sit there going like, why is this happening? Um, like, what is this? Why am I sad? Like, why am I angry? And because this, this isn't happening right now, this is just a documentary about this or it's discussing these possibilities. But like, you know, other things such as like violent depictions or crimes of other types or, you know, uh, whatever stories and anything that they have zero effect on me on, on that capacity. It's specifically um, the hurting of a child um in some okay yeah physical capacity i can't handle it um my body has like really adverse reactions to those things um and uh and i've, I've always been that way so i thought initially oh it's because of what happened to me right something i don't understand about it is triggering and it wasn't until i did the emdr and i did the stuff with my psych that i discovered that's what it was it wasn't the actual it was it was everything associated to it everything all these feelings of just disappointment and um intimacy bad and um the world doesn't understand you what you are you're you're there's something wrong with you there's something you know so for years i i felt like because um i would think back on these memories of what happened to me even as i got older and i would get angry with myself and i would present myself because i'd be like why am i having like why am i having um as as a as a, as a you know as an as an adult or as a teen you know once you went through the puberty and everything um why am i having stimulating thoughts when i think about this part of my past you know what i'm saying so yeah. it would be like why am i sitting here and i think about what happened to me and it's having a effect on my physicality if, if, if you, for lack well, of yeah, you, you, people can get aroused by in fact one of the ways that, that people can um, reclaim things for themselves if people are sexually abused i've done this i had many attempts on me and um one and i see people who and who have you know uh been abused by priests and you know all of these various different forms of things that can happen to children or young adults and things like that. Yeah. And one way to reclaim that sense is, is to use it for your own sexual satisfaction in an exaggerated way where you change the memory so it's one that you're in control of. Oh, and okay. People, well. write porn, people write their own porn to get, and it gives them control over an event that they didn't have control over. 
Oh, I, I, I can see that. Uh, that's probably not something I do, but I can definitely see that uh, working for some people. I'm going to probably think about that further. That's interesting. Well, um, it's getting aroused by the thoughts of it. Yeah, yeah. And, but, that, that, but that was the difficulty of it. That ca caused a further schism between myself and who I am because um, as I got older, it would be like, well, why are these thoughts doing that? Because those things, as I've been conditioned, are horrible and bad and i categorize it to intimacy itself so then it would just be like i'm messed up or i'm wrong for for having this response to these memories and uh but but oh well, sorry i just want to keep this sure. screen going a little bit um and so because i'm having this response any kind of response i would have for for a certain period of time um when my sexuality would come into question because obviously i would see like other things and uh you know i i liked essentially as as people on the server have discussed and know about me i like it all right <laughs> i like it all the departments I have all the categories all the genres not all of all of them some are just not for me but i'm saying uh like human body part wise i'm okay with all of it i like all of it and so i associated that stuff to um like the negativity uh, uh, that, that was imposed upon what happened. So I thought, oh, I lost my autonomy to this person that did this to me. And so the reason I see things or depictions of like, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, I have a physical attraction to, uh, to men as well is because of what happened to me. Uh, and so that's, that's something of a piece of agency that I lost to this person that did this to me. You know what I'm saying? I started blaming the event for my, for my, it, my, my interests as I got older. So it, it became a situation where it wasn't like I was ashamed for, it, it's funny. I, it wasn't that I was ashamed for having these predilections, but I was ashamed that someone took control of me and 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 altered me in some way and i would and i would blame that person for altering me in that way but when in actuality I, I was probably already gonna go in that direction regardless because how, how i am and what i am it, it didn't have anything to do necessarily with what happened to me but, also, but yeah i struggled with that for for a lot of years for for a lot of people i mean um i can't say about you but most everybody that i've met and known and also, you know, the different porn I've read and the people I've spoken to is whatever excited them initially or was the form of sex or even was attached to affection. Like there was one man that he was attracted only to women who smelled like urine. And that turned out to be that the person who gave them the most affection in his life was his nurse, his baby nurse. And she was an older woman, she had had her own children, so she leaked a little urine. So whenever she would hug him, and the hugs were warm, non-sexual hugs, he, the, he attacked, he attacked, that smell got attached to it. And that was part of his sexuality going forward. And he wouldn't have had that. That was so he, had, he was a guy that was into waterworks at that point then, right? Well, he wasn't really into waterworks, but he didn't, wasn't attracted to you if you didn't slightly smell of urine. Now, some people, it would took further and it became into waterworks. Or one guy, when I was homeless in the village, he only was attracted to women. He wanted to see them pee in a bottle in front of him. Now, I don't know what his past was, but the other story was around the nurse. But then there's the people who are into, I, I once bought a porn book. I was looking for like something like the story of O. Mm -hmm. And instead, it was very, very specific. It was people with a Scottish accent who were attracted to people wearing rubber and sweating. And it was, it was so specific that I knew that it had to have been some kind of a compendium of events in this person's life where all these things came together around the time of puberty or something or were so... Yeah. yeah. And since it wasn't as affectionate as the guy whose who's nanny, she was very affectionate, there was yeah. no... Um, you know, there weren't any other kinks attached to it besides that. In this case, you had this really interesting, it had to have a Scott, the person had to speak to you in a Scottish accent, you had to be in a rubber suit, and you had to be sweating. And the what? <laughs> so it can, you know, it can be taken to the ridiculous ends.
Uh-huh. You, you, you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, which brings me like, we should definitely do one sometime. We should do a, a, a talk on that topic alone. Like, I know you'd be interested. Rubber? No, not rubber. <laughs> I know, I'm teasing. I'm I know, it's sexual. But I'm also trying to tell people an important message mm-hmm. that the brain connects things. And therefore, a lot of our predilections, some of them come with us naturally or we're from an early age and we're set by whatever disappointment and others. Others are part of our original, you know, whatever, our, our capacities. And some of us are more flexible in our capacities for sexuality than others. But some others are accidental. And they're just happenstance. And they're <laughs> happenstance. And now you find yourself, um, you know, with certain types of fantasies. Sometimes it doesn't even happen in reality. It just happens like somebody's having fantasies a lot. Mm-hmm. And the fantasies are abstractions of the situation they're in. The fantasies aren't actually happening to them, but they're sadistic or masochistic or complicated or about Nazis doing things to you, whatever. <laughs> Nazis. <laughs> uh, what, what's, really, what's really funny, though, uh, because I've heard a lot of Zoids talk about this sort of stuff. A lot of Zoids have understood this, too, is that many of them have like these elaborate sort of fantasies. Uh, but they would never actually want to partake in them. And that's kind of how I am a lot of the time, too. I'll have like these elaborate sort of erotic fantasies or whatever. But were I to be presented with that situation in real life, I'd be like, no, thank you. I don't want to do any of that. I think yeah, yeah. a lot of people feel. And um, that's why, you know, the, the women who get raped and they say, well, women have fantasies yeah but they don't want that to happen <laughs> no yeah i mean it's because no, the, the can... difference between the fantasy and the occurrence is that well, in one situation you have no control in another situation you have all the control and all the power and all the you are the the originator creator and manipulator of that fantasy that you're creating so uh, if you so... were, can i ask you a question and you yeah. can tell me down if you were as the originator and manipulator now that we're grown we know that we have a lot of power to originate and manipulate our own fantasies and yeah, a lot absolutely. of people saying have been doing it based on sometimes happenstance sometimes mm-hmm. abstractions about events and they're not really they, there's no way that anybody but people who you, you knowing yourself that you would start to put together that I'm having this abstraction because that's my abstract representation in my brain of the closest thing I understand to how this other event that's very small sometimes, but may, had a big feeling effect mm-hmm. uh, made me feel. So, you know, this is just a normal thing is part of what I want to say. So if you were going to go back and this may not be the time for it, a place for it. Mm-hmm. And you are going to rewrite with you in control. I don't know what that 15-year-old's first name was, but if we could give him a first name, it doesn't have to be the real one. I can think, I can think of a couple of ways I could rewrite that. Um, I definitely don't want to talk about that here. Okay, so what I'm saying uh, is one, <laughs> one way to get control out of over some of this stuff and to stop feel like our life was changed forever because of what someone did, or we have to just go along with what. Yeah, they but that's what's interesting is that what the what someone did isn't uh, what would change so my what life. Is, but, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. It was uh, the reaction to what to something. So, did, so uh, if you were going to rewrite the whole script. And, and you don't have to do this out loud. What would yeah. the whole script with your parents, with the kid, with you, with the teachers? And, with and, and that's interesting too, because isn't that what a lot of uh, a lot of Zoid inner fantasy and inner world is the, uh, the rewriting of scripts, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it oftentimes is the rewriting of scripts to the point where you're rewriting the script on an existential level, like you're rewriting everything um you're not rewriting just that event you're especially if you abstract out of just that event and like i do and everything else you start rewriting everything and i i think that's part of why i have my ideas on uh why that is a lot of schizoids are um interested in like idiosyncratic thinking type stuff or esoteric subjects or the occult or the metaphysical or the philosophical is because those avenues allow you to rewrite a lot of stuff internally 
they allow you to rewrite existence as a whole in uh, by by creating new avenues of understanding it or perceiving it and so on and so it gives you these tools in order to rewrite it all uh inside um and i think that's why uh i think that's uh, i'm starting to think that's why that we gravitate toward this, those things like um like in the case of me it would be you know philosophy i have an interest in the occult i have interest in uh, metaphysical stuff i have an interest in paranormal things i have an interest in media fiction uh stories narratives archetypes like everything else because like the more i know about all these things the more i can rewrite things and under or understand them in different ways so that i can perceive them in a multitude and multifaceted ways that aren't all bad that's right uh, it's a great frame reframe things to to my heart's content um and the reframes are just as true in their own way you know yeah they're, absolutely they're, well at least in terms another yeah. angle they can be another angle another way to look at it and sometimes we're doing it very cleverly as little kids and we don't know why we're doing it and we don't know that we don't have the connections even in adulthood as to what we, why we thought that in response to whatever living arrangement we were in. I mean, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's a hard connection. Sometimes it's a very obvious connection. And other times it's a tenuous, um, you know, there were a lot of steps that happened. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the person um, came up with this fantasy as a result of undergoing those experiences. But if you looked at this fantasy, you wouldn't see those experiences directly in it but you might see an exaggerated version or a changed version, a symbolic version of um, an ex usually an exaggerated version or conversely something entirely different like uh, a client of mine who decided who in her fantasy she lives in a different in a different um, era entirely and she's all the people she's not one person so yeah I mean because what's funny is that a lot the Zoid essentially is trying to cling and grasp at connecting to something or someone so much that we extend our reach into time and space uh we extend our reach into beyond the material in order to desperately find something to connect to in this life um because so much of it doesn't make sense or we don't relate to it especially within our own time period or our own world or dimension or whatever you want to call it it just seems so foreign and alien and disappointing and terrible so i'm thinking that whatever the conclusion that we draw mm -hmm. at whether we're a zoid or non-zoid mm -hmm. um i'm actually making less and less of these distinctions between you know zoid and non-zoid i mean you've gotten to know me a little you know, people are very keen on neurotypical versus non-neurotypical. I'm not so keen on that. Oh, okay. Because no, I, I mean the, the only the only when I when I bring those subjects up, I'm more in reference to. I think the best way because that's just the words that are used, but the, yeah. the way I perceive it is, um, like layer perception or a, abstract to concrete layer perception. That's all it is. Like, what do you intuitively gravitate toward? uh what what is your default setting and um and my default setting along with a lot of schizoids i talk to is that layer of more vague abstraction and kind of openness and well uh, I'm so and so for like living in the symbolic living in the metaphor living in the category uh separating from the individual self um and going beyond and so on and so forth in a variety of ways in different directions uh and different avenues but um and that that's the default setting that's like that i think that's one of the fundamental differences is that that's what caused me as a child to be different than the other kids is that cognitive aspect it, it's that it's that i'm here these are the this is what i envision as important or interesting and it's over here in this other layer and all the children are, or most of the children are over here in these layers and so I'm, I'm, I'm the odd man out. And many of us have felt like that. Many uh, schizoids feel like the odd man out because their thinking just did not align uh, at the, or even the earliest age. Um, and obvi obviously, like I said, that 
that's a whole different thing. It's a whole different can of worms. But, but I am interested in how much um, was a normal way of thinking for people. Um, uh, I was born thinking, yeah. I was born without the hypocrisy gene and I had to learn it. And I, especially about sex and things that, and violence, and it's pretty much about sex and violence, but sex more because I was born in 1945 and sex was forbidden. And um, but people lied about it all the time. And yeah. I knew they were, I found out they were all lying. And in fact, they would be mad at me for speaking any truths about it. My no, yeah, about of course. People. So I don't know really. I'm trying to see. Where I, I'm trying. I'm trying to like explain it. It's it's kind of like the difference between um, doing it, like making a conscious effort to do that, and it being just your setting to the point where it becomes a handicap in a world that doesn't function that way. Like to the point where I can't like my executive function. Um, it requires me making executive function decision making to stay on that middle playing field of thinking. To, to, well, to, I, I have to actually make an effort like this. That's how I've always told people, you know, like the same way that a regular person has to make an effort to go to these kind of abstract places a lot of the time uh, and have to make a conscious effort to be there and they can't always be there because it's not comfortable and it's not where they want to be all the time. They'd rather be in that kind of intermediate uh, uh, layer. That's That intermediate layer is the one that I have to actively, consciously make an effort toward just to be there for long periods of time. I, I guess my real question is, and it's, it remains to be answered, yeah. is, you know, I, I read the theories, I hear the stories, I know myself, I know the stories of the people who come to me, um, is how much of this would have been something that we would have passed through. Like I've passed through stages, like I remember being a perfect little narcissistic power hungry toddler. I mean, I have the memories. I remember I was interested in power and I remember, so this, I should have turned out like a narcissist, but I didn't. And I remember from my stepfather going through a schizoid stage. I had very elaborate fantasies every night before I went to bed. And I read all the time. And that's when, you know, I knew that I wasn't going to get anything I wanted and I was being neglected and it was just, you know, harsh. It wasn't abusive. It was, it was harsh in a, yeah. in, in a certain atmosphere. And so, but I didn't turn out schizoid. Do you see what I mean? I went through the stage, but something else happened. And but, well, the, uh, and the, the argument I always pose when it comes to that is because you eventually discovered that the external world possesses something that you can find value in and connect to, right? Um, on even their playing field. Um, and for the, for, the, for the person that ends up schizoid for most of the time, that from what I've seen and what I've observed, um, that's not the case. Um, it, the world doesn't seem to have anything to offer. Uh, and it isn't until you find other people like yourself that you start seeing those things that could be offered. And that's what people keep describing to me on the server and in the community is I haven't connected to a single human being my entire life and whatever frameworks are designed for human beings to connect to up until this point. Um, because the thinking starts correlating, the conversations start making sense, the language doesn't need to be translated anymore. Um, it's just there the intuitiveness of being in that kind of layer of thinking is just automatically there and we're comfortable there and we can be there and we don't have to step outside of it when we're together. Well, I, I guess I'm wondering, and it's always a question in my field, how hmm. much defense and stuckness in a period where we didn't get what we needed to transition out of it and how much is innate and that's always the question. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. Yeah. I think there's definitely, a, but that's my issue is that um, there is no, it's all nurture. Oftentimes they keep talking nurture, 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 nurture. And and that's my issue with some of the, uh, the, the, the schizoid stuff that keeps getting discussed in like the literature and stuff like that. 
but you know that's that's probably off topic but point is is it's all nurture nurture developmental developmental nurture 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 um this didn't happen that wasn't neglected this wasn't done as a child they're stuck in this phase they're doing this they're doing that um that's all i hear and i don't hear any talk of nature uh and it's frustrating because there's there in my opinion there is a a fundamental distinction there and there's an important factor because we in the case of like like i said in the case of the autistic child we would not be saying it's all nurture no and and i'm wondering too see for me always it, it's and masterson really the people who wrote about it you you're re reading a lot of nurture now but uh it, it's not really what's in all the books and it's not what the theorists are really thinking masterson always said personality disorders were nature nurture and fate some combination of them and sometimes one will be more important than the other and when i'm okay. talking about things i say you know a, a child with a specific special temperament of their own and a particular genetic inheritance is born into a family that did or did not meet them wherever they were with that inheritance and that temperament. And in order to find a place in that family, some authenticity had to be compromised. And people went, and depending on how much the family dynamic and culture fit the, the child naturally, you know, mm -hmm. and some people can't become narcissists. They're born with too much empathy. They're much more likely to go become schizoids, in my opinion, or a borderline or something like that. And you, not everybody can be a narcissist and not everybody can become schizoid without an awful lot of work. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's like no, not everybody's a poet. And if they do poetry, they're not going to do the same type. And so I, I do think that there is like you get this little kid with yeah, yeah. whoever they are. And then it's some some little kids are a lot easier to meet their needs. They're I mean, this is uh, there's been a lot of work on the easy to nurture child and the harder to nurture and uh, things like that. Um, Stella Chess and Thomas, I get, get their names from yeah. Thomas and Chess talked about that. But pretty much we're we're coming towards about what I have time and energy for. So one oh, no, for sure. No, that, that was that, that was good. We've been we've been talking for like two hours. So yeah. So tell me what is this like uh, the way that I wrap up things, like if this was a session. Yeah, do do uh, wrap it up. We'll be leaving some time at the end and say, okay let's be honest and have a couple of minutes of evaluation and tell me pluses and minuses of your experience with me today doing whatever we did today and anything that's unfinished for you that you'd like to say and anything that you'd like me to know or to ask me that would be how i would end uh, pluses and minuses um the pluses were mo it's mostly pluses like uh, i feel like the conversation went really well i feel like you asked the right questions i feel like i actually made a, a little bit of a discovery um early on especially about the character stuff so that's interesting um and um i feel like uh the feedback was good and i feel like uh, people are gonna watch this and go hey that was interesting and i i i hope that inspires them to want to uh, test their own waters and maybe do something similar um, with somebody that is appropriate for them. The only cons uh, we can think of are, you know, just our little, you know, uh, it's not even a con. It's just like a frustration of like trying to convey uh, some of those ideas, uh, you know, the cognitive stuff and trying to con kind of trying to convey that. And then getting the, the the response of you know maybe it's not that maybe it's you know and, and you're probably you know, that's the thing I, I shouldn't see that as a negative because I want it to be uh, I want to be constructively criticized about my ideas and thoughts and so it's really really helpful to see that I might be you know this might be not the case this might be different or so on and so forth but it just I've seen too much experienced too much and read too much to 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 think that yet so i'm not quite convinced that um that it's all that the that the the nurture component is um the nature component is not is being understood um it that, may, that's, not, may not be i i'm not no absolutely 
you that's know, a, that, yeah, but that, that's not a con. A question a, mark for me. This is a question mark in my thinking. Mm -hmm. Where where is this line? Um, yeah. Chicken you know, or egg, yeah, type situation. It, yeah, it's not or. It's like an Being additive manager. thing because um, what allows me to talk about almost anything mm -hmm. is I had that when I was born. Mm -hmm. And then I had to learn not to talk about a lot of stuff openly. Yeah. So yeah. I know that some part of it is, is born because I was, I, I know what parts I can remember as far back as I can. And then the overlay on that. Um, so I'm still trying to separate out and I'm not sure that anyone knows one of the reasons I'm so willing to align with you over your project is I don't think people really know. No, they don't. And, um, and if, well, if they were able to see some of the interactions and conversations and study them, uh, they could probably know a little better uh, the way we relate to one another, the way Zoids relate to another uh, and talk to each other on the server isn't through just the capacity of, oh, we suffer in a similar fashion, but it's uh, beyond that. It's something about language. It's something about understanding. It's something about how language is interpreted and, and conveyed and what what we understand to be life and sentience and everything else um but anyway um so yeah i think that went extremely well and i like everything and i don't really have anything else i would need to share or bring up i hope you felt the same I yeah, you, for, it for me, well. it was exciting to, it's exciting to work with you and thank you for your honesty and willingness to to, to share these um Difficult. It's no big deal. Oh. Honestly, like it, it's no big deal only because like the, the stuff that actually hits home and concerns me on a, every day is like is way different. Like yeah, this this is not the stuff that like I'm okay. I'm That's falling into a fetus position over. Uh you know, this is the uh, there's other stuff that is more, you know, like I said, abstract and odd and all of that. Okay. Like, so um so oh, this I is fine. I, I'm fine. So I really appreciate, you know, you giving me the opportunity to learn more because I think that's what's really happening. The reason I'm telling you about what is thought in the field or what I'm struggling with as a theorist to try and understand, and as a human being also, my clients yeah. help, is that you have part of the piece and you're seeing, like I listened to today to two of the interviews, one with Rev and the Rev. other. I don't know which is the other one you saw because I've only the done one. one was a, a, um, a guy who I think he was he identified as autistic had oh, um, okay. packet. No, it, yeah, yeah, that, that, see, those, but those those interviews were prior uh, to the all of this. Yeah, oh, yeah, all of this because the new interview, the Rev one, that one we formulated questions with a lot of this stuff in mind and everything we've learned so far about the PD itself and the stuff in the literature and everything else and your work as well. Like we formulated those questions um, with all that in mind. That older interview was just me trying to like, you know, look in the dark and just trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, well, see, that's, that's when where I, was... I am now is I'm looking at these things and I'm trying for me to separate it out because, um, what I call schizoid plus. I see people who are straight schizoid sometimes, and it, it goes pretty easily for me because I'm open and wherever I can facilitate. But then I see schizoid plus some kind of twist that I don't understand. And that's- yeah, Well, what, maybe we can help each other understand. Yeah, that. yeah. And where the twist comes in, sometimes the twist comes in, like uh, Burb has helped me with the autistic version of the twist. Yeah. Um, or some of that but i know that i'm seeing something that's more than it seems to me more than just schizoid lessons. oh yeah i oh yeah there's something okay. going on and there. that's the part um, where where i don't where i think uh, that's I the part where i need burb that. because burb has much better use of the english language when it comes to or or better control of the language when it comes to like being really concise and a uh, very much, just better at explaining stuff i'm very vague because i'm like i said i'm always just like trying to pack things together but um but yeah well thank you for this uh thank you for joining me uh thank you to anybody watching i hope you enjoyed this um also uh i have to do this part but uh please please um 
support me on Patreon if you're interested in the project and you want me to spend more time doing this sort of stuff. And I want to dedicate more time to it, but you know, you know how it is resources uh, and uh, or PayPal, whatever the heck you want to do. Uh, if you can't do any of that, obviously, please subscribe, like it, um, share it, drop the links wherever you want, join the server if you feel that it's something that could be useful to you. Um, and so on and so forth. Do all those things. And also uh, buy Eleanor's book if you haven't. So yeah, there you now, go. There's your book. Buy, is, buy, uh, is in a different, people are wondering about differential diagnosis and you're confused. Am I schizoid? Do I have narcissistic tendencies? Chapter three, this book came, I wrote, put it out in 16. So my thinking has evolved since then. But basically in chapter three, I do a comparison in plain English of what I know about borderline narcissist and schizoid and subtypes. And I have a glossary at the end. Chapter three compared to the others. And then I collected 40 years of dreams. And I abstracted the best ones that were most representative. And very often they're made into science fiction films, not from the people's dreams, but I, I see a lot of films that have schizoid themes. Once you, oh, like yeah, said, yeah. you know, figure ground formation, I see schizoid, I see borderline, I see narcissistic. Oh, yeah, yeah. borderline radio station, that's a schizoid movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I, I, I actually see a lot of that stuff too now yeah. uh, that I've done a lot of reading and I've looked into this stuff further. But, not, oh. not my book and I'm not in it, but the person who taught me about schizoid wrote the first seven chapters of Disorders of the Self, The Masterson Approach. Oh, we, we need to do, we need to do uh, not uh, a conversation with Burb is feeling better. Burb was supposed to join us today, but Burb is sick and not feeling too good. But we need to definitely do uh, something like this in which we dig into together, into that particular book and anything else. And, uh, and I'll let Burb probably take the reins on that one more than myself, because like I said, it'll be really fun to kind of see a little bit of debate and argumentation and theoretical kind of conversation um between verb and myself and yourself and what you understand and what how we will we be observed and so on and so forth it'd be really fun to do something like that and because because we, we're all friends here and is it possible that people might be interested in a schizoid book club <laughs> um unfortunately i tried to do a book club on my server but it wasn't a schizoid specific one it was just a book club where i tried to randomize it and i even tried to poll like what genre do you guys want to read and then I said, okay, this is the genre that was voted on. These are some books that I found that, could, that fit that genre. Uh, and it didn't go well at all. Like I ended up reading the book by myself and like one, of, one or two other people read the book and like 12 people had said they would read it, but nobody did. And it was just, and it was, it's too much. It's really difficult to uh, get Zoids to, to do stuff. And I don't blame them or fault them for it. It's just, uh, I was like, yeah, book clubs. With I'll like tell you why reading. I'm interested. There's a batch of writers who, who have read and made no sense of writing on schizoid, who take it into a very complicated place, with complicated abstract language that um, I cannot understand. And I don't know if I don't understand it because it's wrong or it's not useful. Okay, so how about this? That's actually a pretty cool idea. How about this? Um, tell me, uh, text me what book that is. Uh, give me an example of a book that's like that. And I can definitely put it out there on the server and be like, hey, guys, and people know your name now. Uh, if they didn't already, especially since the video that we did initially did extremely well um at, at least within you know my demographic so they might i'll say hey eleanor wants us to check this book out whoever's interested read it and then you can't make head or tails of it okay whoever's interested read it and then let's let's do, make it yeah we'll make like a thread or something and where we can discuss that book for whoever's interested in reading it so we could help eleanor understand that book uh, okay. And let's see if our crazy Zoid abstracty brains can make head or tails of it. Um, and, you know, but just, just send me the link. Just tell me what book it is. And sure. I'll well, throw it out there for them. I'm sure there's some, some of us out there uh, that'll be like, sure, that sounds fun. And maybe we'll Amy. So I have to go now. It was okay. Nice. Thank you for having me and thank you for your patience. No, for sure. Always. Bye -bye. Thank you for yours. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.